Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 103. My name is Mark, and it's just me today, as I am going to do a Q&A podcast. Uh, I am in the week in between the madness of my summer schedule, which involves traveling all over the United States, doing debate camps, which is something I coach that's the main thing I do outside of board game stuff is coaching speech and debate and it's camp season and I got invited to do a bunch of different camps all over the country and they are all back to back and so uh, this is my last week home, full week home until September, right now being the middle of July. So I thought I'd do another Q&A podcast, something I haven't done in a while and so I solicited questions on social media. I solicited questions from my patrons on my Discord channel, and I got some cool ones. In fact, I got some new ones just now on Discord right when I was posting that I was about to go live because this is a great segue. I have no one to brag to about how good this segue is, except all of you. Uh, If you are a patron of The Thoughtful Gamer, you can get access to the live streams of these podcast recordings and for instance, can ask additional questions on Q&As or just any time on the podcast because I'll see your comments. So go to patreon.com slash thoughtfulgamer and you can support me and keep me going. Still quite a ways away from the end of the year goal of where I would like to get to continue the Thoughtful Gamer as it is and not cut back a lot. I'm really hoping I can get there, but uh, it's been a little slow going, so... If you have enjoyed these podcasts, consider contributing just a little bit. It's hardly any money at all for the kind of minimum bid, $2 a month. And uh, you can help uh, help the Thoughtful Gamer, because I would like to continue this. But as I mentioned a few weeks ago, i got to hit some monetary goals to uh, keep up at the pace I am going. Anyways, let's get into the questions. I got some interesting questions. I said board game or non-board game. And I got mostly board game questions, but also some non-board game questions, which I uh, I like. So I kind of organized them. Let's start off with some of these board game specific questions, starting with one that I think is very, very interesting. Uh, the question is, what board game would cause the biggest impact if removed from history in the last 30 years? And considering counterfactuals like this is always fascinating because you don't know you don't know all the trickle effects of this kind of thing, right? You don't know, what does it mean if removed from history? Like, is that game gone, but everything else stayed the same? Or are we talking about the, the, the domino effect of what happens if that game never gets made? And when you start thinking about the domino effect stuff, it very quickly becomes far too complicated and you start getting silly about it. So I'm going to throw out a few. I think obviously, I I think the obvious answer that's going to come to everyone's mind first is probably the correct answer. That's Catan. You know, that's what, that's the game that breaks through and becomes popular in the United States. And now you get a big giant market, US market interested in these Euro games. It kind of, everything kind of flows from that. So it's probably the right answer. The runners-up, I think, are more interesting. So here are the runners-up I came with. First, uh, there's Pandemic. It's not the first cooperative game, but it is the cooperative game that makes cooperative games really, really popular. So that has a big influence. Along those same lines, you have Dominion, which makes deck building really, really popular. Of course, the question is, if Pandemic and Dominion don't happen, I think someone comes up with these ideas pretty soon anyways like cooperative games were around before pandemic deck building kind of was because it's drawn from uh magic the gathering drafting was kind of the main inspiration and then i believe i've heard people argue that the starcraft board game long out of print from fantasy flight had something that looked very very similar to dominion's deck building a couple years before Dominion. So I didn't pick one of those, like this kind of like genre or mechanical innovations we saw in the last 30 years, because I think they would have gotten popular anyways. Other significant games, you got uh, Shadows Over Camelot, a game I 
don't understand why people enjoy, but it is the first true, what I would call trader game. And I looked this up on Board Game Geek, and basically you have werewolves or mafia, which kind of is a trader game, but not really. I mean, that's a team game from the start. Shadows Over Camelot introduces the possibility of a trader, and it introduces a game that is a cooperative game except for this one trader thing, uh, which has since become extremely popular. And I was actually surprised to see in the list of at least the games that have been categorized on Board Game Geek as a hidden trader game. You After Werewolf and then Shadows Over Camelot, basically the next one is Battlestar Galactica. I didn't realize Battlestar Galactica was that early in that style of game, which is interesting. And then I tried to think of what are some of the other big trends of the last 30 years, and I thought, oh, the, the heavy Euro. That's a new thing. And I think a lot of people look back at Democker as the first heavy Euro, which falls outside of this 30-year band that we're looking at because it was uh, released in 1986, I believe. And I don't know if Democker is super responsible because we don't see a whole lot of heavy Euros for a while after Democker. So it, it, yeah, maybe it's like the grandfather, but is it the father of the heavy Euro? And then I think, what is the father of the heavy Euro? What makes that kind of game really popular? And I have a couple ideas. Um, again, looking at scouring some board game geek advanced searches to find some of these early games that are heavy games. And you have the 18xx games, but that's kind of its own thing. That doesn't lead to, you know, the gallerist or, I don't know, whatever your fa favorite heavy euro is. And in fact, I mean, you might argue that, like, Stefan Feld's stuff is what eventually leads to, like, the heavy euro as we see it today. Because he's essentially doing at a medium weight what we see with Vital Lacerda. Uh, but there's a couple I pointed out. So you've got, in 1999, you have Roads and Boats, which is one of Splatter's first games. And I don't know how much direct influence Splatter has, has had in influencing gamers, but I think there's a not insignificant amount of influence on Splatter on game designers. So that might be significant. Uh, and then slightly newer than that, you have Agricola and Through the Ages, which I think are the first two big hits that you would consider heavy Euro games. So those are some ideas. Oh, I forgot to mention another one of my runners up is the party game scene of the last 20 years is largely defined by apples to apples, right? That's got to be mentioned, I think. I mean, in terms of games that have been duplicated and replicated and repeated all over the place outside of, I mean, or I guess in the same category as Dominion or Pandemic, you have apples to apples. I mean, it's got to be right there. But I think it's probably Catan. That's probably the big one. Although, when is Magic the Gathering? Is it, wait, Magic the Gathering in the last 30 years? Did I miss that? Oh, it is. I thought it was before. I thought it was like 90 or 91. Magic the Gathering in 1993. Oh, that one might be the winner. It's a tie between Catan and Magic the Gathering. Why didn't that show up in my search? Weird. I don't know how I missed that. Yeah, if Magic the Gathering doesn't happen, I think that beats Catan. I think some other Euro game, like Catan wasn't the first Euro game. Magic was pretty pioneering. Well, but I mean, even Magic is inspired greatly by Cosmic Encounter. But do we get the number of games that include lots of rules on cards and lots of unique decks without Magic the Gathering. I don't know if that becomes as significant as it is. I think without Catan, Euro games are still as significant as they are. It would just be some other Euro game that would have done it for the West, for the United States audience. All right, question number two is a question that I have absolutely no authority to answer. And that is board games, good board games. What are some good board games to play while also holding a baby? I don't really hold babies. Babies hate me. Whenever I attempt to communicate with an infant, it cries or gets upset every single time. And I keep telling this to people and they keep putting babies in front of me. And I say, hello. And I try to smile and act friendly and they do not like it. They don't like my face. They don't like my voice. They don't like my whole thing. 
Uh, so I definitely don't hold babies because that seems like a terrible idea if they don't even like how I look or sound. Uh, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to risk holding one. So, uh, I have no idea, but board games to play when you have essentially one hand, it's almost every board game, right? Like, I think you could do that. Not a real time game probably, but you can, for anything with the public where most of the game is out in the open, you can just tell other people to move your stuff for you. Just tell them what you want to do and they can do it. And even games with a hand of cards, I think you can get card holders that will hold those cards for you. Um, so I think you'd want to stay away from stuff with lots of hidden information that you're constantly having to look at. Uh, but pretty much anything out in the open, that would work, right? Almost every game, as I look at my shelf of games, and I suppose obviously you would also probably want to consider games that don't suffer if you have to drop out, like if the baby you know, has some kind of pressing need uh, and you can just have someone play for you or the game supports you dropping out would probably be a consideration. I don't know. I have cats, and uh, if they're annoying, I just throw them on the floor and tell them to go away. So can't probably do that with a baby as much. Along the same lines, I got a question of what age do you introduce kids to wargaming and what games would you use as your very first war games? So two part question, what age would I introduce kids to wargaming? They probably do that themselves before you would, right? I don't know. As kids, I, I, I have very poor memory of myself as a kid, but I'm pretty sure kids invent violent fighty games very early on just by themselves. So they're probably playing fight, you know, violent style games already. But what age would I introduce kids to war gaming? I don't know when they seem interested in it. Again, I'm not a parent. Why am I answering parenting questions? Uh, the cool thing about board games, unlike video games or something, is that it's so abstracted that war games can be a really cool history lesson. Obviously, it's the history of war which is, you know, not insignificant, but not all of history. Uh, but you don't, it's unlike video games where they can get very, very violent. You're not going to see that as much in board games. So you can probably introduce kids as early as you want and start talking about the history of it all. And then it becomes a history lesson. So whenever they seem like they'd be down to play, I guess. What game would I use as their first war game? I mean, I don't seek out a lot of simple war games. So Memoir 44 is the first one I think of, and I looked at all the other war games I've played. That's the simplest one. It doesn't have a lot of hidden information, and even the hidden information it does have, if you're playing with a kid, probably not that significant. You can probably play with open hands, and it'd be fine. Not ideal, but fine. And they get to chuck some dice, and the dice are pretty easy to understand, and you got little minis. Uh, which kids are going to like, and it's pretty straightforward what you want to do. So that's my pick. Everything else either is too complex or has too much hidden information. But again, I'm not super familiar on what simple war games are out there. That's the simplest one I've played. Next question. Here's an interesting one from someone on Twitter. And the question is, could you talk about how to get people to notice your game I find that it, it is easier to make a great game than it is to get a great, great following. I'm going to tackle the second half of that question first, or statement, that it's easier to make a great game than it is to get a great following. I don't think it's that easy to make a great game. Now, maybe I'm just bad at game design. I have dabbled in a couple designs that have gotten to the very early prototype stage. And I think it's probably easy to make an acceptable prototype. So a prototype that functions. I think you can get there pretty easily. Turning in that into a published, polished game is difficult because you need a wide variety of skills there. You need graphic design, you need uh, just the computer, the program design to use the programs that are needed to get something to where it can be printed and sent to a manufacturer. Uh, that's difficult to me, at least. Maybe you're very familiar with that kind of stuff. But even doing like the balancing and the play testing and the data collection and the thinking through all that development seems pretty difficult. 
And that's just make a game to make a game that functions. Not to mention like rules writing. So many games that are independently made really, really screw up the rules. I mean, I was just playing a game the other day that I could not figure out a rule. And I even went to Board Game Geek and couldn't figure it out. And finally, after we had played, and this wasn't some side rule, this is fundamental, like how to perform one of the main actions of the game was completely ambiguous in the rule book. And I didn't find the answer till afterwards, later in bed, when I was just scrolling through the BGG forums just to find the answer to this question. All that seems pretty difficult, and that's to make an acceptable game that functions. I think it's very difficult to make a great game, and the reason why is because there's only a couple or a few great games made each year. Games that I would call great. Only a couple. In fact, let me look at my list right now. So in my scoring system, I define great as a game I give a seven and a half or above two out of 10. And I am constantly searching for great games. Like I don't really play or accept a game unless I think it could be great or at least interesting um, or interesting enough to look at. But mostly I'm trying to find great games. I'm trying to find the best games ever. In 2020, according to my spreadsheet here, which is not completely updated, but it was updated for my end of the year uh, best games of 2020 list. I've got 11 great games that I played. And a couple of these, upon further play, might drop below that. 2021, I've played many more 2021 releases, and I've got 12 that are at that 7.5 or above. And again, a lot of these are based on one play right now, could drop below that with further plays. 2022, I've got much fewer games played. Three of them have that rating. One of them's not even published yet. So I think it's very hard to make a great game. If it wasn't hard, we'd see a whole lot more of them. But maybe, you know, I don't know. I don't know this person who was asking the question. It was just a, a person on Twitter who I had not interacted with before to my knowledge. So maybe they do find it very easy to make a great game. But I think, I don't know, in my experience, the people who email me or I see on social media talking about how their game is great, the more they talk about that, the less likely it is that their game is actually great. I mean, I've seen emails where they're talking about how the game is going to revolutionize board gaming, and it's like literally shoots and ladders. Like they, they clearly don't, un, they don't know what board gaming is. I'm not saying that's what this person is. Again, I don't know this person, but I think making a great game is extremely difficult. That said, marketing, getting <laughs> your name out there, letting people know about what you do is a complete mystery to me. So maybe it is more difficult. I don't know how to market very well. I know what people have told me. So if you go back to my podcast episode 67 with Patrick Rowland. He talks about how, and he's a marketing guy. That's like what he does. And he did this whole thing where he, in a year, he was going to make a game and get it published and all that, do the whole thing, start to back in a, in a year. And he did that and he made a decent game. It was all right. I reviewed it called Fry, Fry Thief. And the one thing I remember from talking with him was how much he stressed the importance of having a newsletter list and a mailing list. So that's the one advice I will pass along to people is that you should attempt to make a newsletter mailing list, a list of emails that have opted into receiving newsletters from you so that when you do have new information about your game, or trying to gauge interest, you can hopefully have hundreds or thousands of email addresses you are sending that information to. Because he emphasized that getting an email is the type of communication that has the best response. So not my advice, uh, because I did not come up with it, but it seems legit to me, so I will pass that on. Other than that, I have no clue how to effectively market without becoming completely inauthentic and just diving into trends. 
I am working on it personally. I've talked with some very, very helpful people who have given me advice about how to do it without becoming inauthentic and just succumbing to vapid trends. All that said, please become a patron (laughs) or follow me on social media or subscribe to my YouTube channel like that. But good luck on your game, person who asked this question. All right, let's get to some lighter questions. I think these all came from Lindsay, who you've heard on the podcast before. Yeah, these definitely came from Lindsay. Maybe not this first one, but what's my favorite color? It's orange. I don't know why. Uh, It's the color I choose in board games if it is available. If not, I choose the most boring color. That's my heuristic for board game color choices. And there's not really a reason why. It's mostly, I suppose, to avoid arguing or having any kind of confrontation with someone over their favorite color. So I can have something fairly consistent, right? So if I'm green one game and I'm blue the next game and I'm red the next game and then I'm white and then I'm black. Like if I jump around that much, I'm going to forget and it's going to be confusing game to game what color I am. So if I have some consistency with a color that's not chosen a lot, then it's easier to remember what color you are. So I've definitely been in a game and been sitting there thinking over my strategy and thinking something's not right here. And then I realized I was looking at the wrong color and evaluating the board state with the, with the incorrect color, the color I played in the game before. And like, ah, that's what's going wrong in my head and I just wasted everyone's time thinking about a strategy that is not accessible to me. Anyways, I like orange. Next question. This one's definitely from Lindsay because she's listing her least favorite games and the game that annoys me the most. Choose between these to play forever until you die. Root, Bananagrams, and Vast. Uh, She really did not like Vast and Root and I hate Bananagrams because I am bad at it, and I would just rather play Scrabble. Uh, But between those three games, definitely Root. I am not the biggest fan of Root. I don't get it. I don't get why it was so popular. I mean, in some sense, I do. The art is magnificent. I love the idea of it. Playing it, though, I do not understand how it got the popularity it did. I really, really, really don't. I'm going to write about this at some point, like I did with my Terraforming Mars review where I approached it from the idea of what made this game popular that I simply do not get as an as a way of analyzing the game in kind of a a unique way because they're already too popular really to do a straight review on like everything that's going to be said about it's probably been said so analyzing it retro retroactively or retrospectively I suppose anyways I'm going to eventually do that with a root because I really have never played a game of root that I've enjoyed. I think I've played it five times and I have never enjoyed it. However, if I was to play it forever until I die, that was my game I had to play. I could probably figure out some formulation with all the expansion stuff and with people who really like it. That would be enjoyable. I don't see that happening with vast, uh, which seems far too simplistic and complicated at the same time or bananagrams, which just sucks. Yeah. Root's got more meat on the bones there, even if it's meat that I do not have a taste for. And the final question that's definitely from Lindsay is which is more of a game Candyland or shoots and ladders. I believe they're essentially the same game, right? Both you just draw a card or in shoots and ladders. Do you roll a die? I think you have some randomizing thing and it tells you how many spaces to move and stuff happens to you. I think that's how both of those games function. Uh, In which case, I'm going to say that they are the same amount of game because they're both games without choices, which, you know, maybe that's a game, maybe it isn't. Depends on your definition of game. But insofar as they don't have choices and they're otherwise very similar, they're the same amount. It's been a long time since I've looked at those. All right. Now we're shifting into le- more serious questions. Those were the less serious ones. Uh, we got a couple economics questions, which are very fun. Uh, so this question is, I grew up on the U.S.-Canadian border. What changes need to take place to lower the international transaction costs to ship or sell board games from one country to the other? And this is also interesting because in the league that I coach in primarily, uh, our 
policy debate resolution is about international trade, uh, bet- or U.S. trade policy, rather. And I don't think that it's that expensive. And I know people are going to be like, whoa, it's super expensive to ship things. But is it more expensive than the alternative? Now, maybe if we expect the shipping costs to stay high, the co- you know the COVID inspired, not created, not inspired, uh, created shipping costs to stay super high. Maybe it then becomes more cost effective to manufacture things locally. So maybe you manufacture some in the United States and some in Europe and some in Asia and you, you ship more locally. But insofar as most games are still manufactured in China and then transported all across the globe, that means that the shipping costs as high as they are still make that process financially worth it. Again, maybe, and maybe likely, I might say likely, it wasn't financially worth it during the peak shipping crisis costs. Uh, But you forecast out that those are going to go away and that it's not worth the large transition period to invest in more manufacturing in other places. That might be. So I think the shipping thing is just a function of COVID supply stuff. Otherwise, I think it is cheap to ship them relative to manufacturing locally, or else there'd be more local manufacturing. I looked up to see if there are any tariffs on board games in the United States, and it doesn't look like there are any. I remember that there was one point during the trade war when Trump was in office uh, where it looked like one of the tariffs he was going to institute on China Uh, Might have affected board games, but I don't think it happened. I looked up, and there's basically nothing if your game is marketed towards adults. Let me find the exact wording here. Yeah, that that is the exact wording. If the game is explicitly marketed towards adults, there's a certain code you file it under, but there's not a trade. If it is meant for children, there are more safety regulations on there, which might increase some costs. But it doesn't look like there are any extra costs for importing into the United States, at least. But what caused the prices to go insane during COVID? I mean, there are a lot of causes there, but primarily you have a rapid change in demand. For shipping, demand goes up because people are staying home more and now they want to have things shipped to them rather than going out into the world and purchasing them locally at stores. Simultaneously, You have a shrinkage in supply because people are less able to work in shipping because they have to stay home in all kinds of adjacent industries and such. So, I mean, from straight economic perspective, that's what happened. There's probably some regulatory stuff. But, yeah, there's these massive changes that were largely unpredictable. And any kind of unpredictable change like that can cause big, big things to happen. In in fact, it's one of the main principles of governing an economic policy is that you want things to be very predictable because the more predictable things are, the more smoothly they can run. And things that are unpredictable and sudden, or even the perception that something sudden or unpredictable may happen, can cause the economy to hurt. Uh, It can cause panics and cause... Uh, investors to pull out and, you know, the more smooth it is, the the better it's going to be, um, which is why in something I was talking to my debate students about is that pretty much any time there's going to be some kind of regulatory change that affects businesses or the way industries operate, there's a period of time where they publish what these changes are going to be and allow Uh, organizations and businesses to adjust to those changes or at least have some kind of foresight on how what those changes are going to be. They don't just pass the law and it happens the next day. Uh, Or they don't just, the regulatory agency doesn't just change it overnight. There's a review built in. So what can happen to lower the costs? I don't know if there's that much that will lower the costs long run. Um, unless there are some really bad or unnecessary regulations out there that are impeding international shipping. One that's very fascinating for the United States that I find crazy, uh, although not necessarily applicable to this question, is called the Jones Act. And it regulates 
what's called cabotage. I believe that's how it's pronounced. It's one of those words I actually haven't heard spoken in a long time. I've only read it, but it, it's spelled like sabotage but with a C. Cabotage is simply when you ship from one point in your country on a boat or a ship uh, to another point in your country. And so in the United States, we have this thing called the Jones Act that was instituted in 1920, I believe. And it says that for that type of shipping, it has to be done by a boat that was, or a ship that was made in the United States that has a U.S. flag, a U.S. captain, a U.S. crew, and is owned by a U.S. company. And the reason for it was so that we would have a class of what they called merchant marines, so that if we entered a time of war, we could use these ships to help fight the war. But what it does is it incentivizes these insane transport things where, for instance, you'll see something that was made in the United States and then packaged somewhere in Asia and then ship back to the United States because it would be cheaper to have it packaged thousands of miles away in a different country so that it, it's never cabotage. It goes from the U.S. to a separate country back to the United States uh, because it's cheaper to do that than it is to just have it manufactured in the United States, moved over to a shipping or a, 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 some other plant to, to package it and then just sold in the United States. So you get weird stuff like that because of the Jones Act. I don't know. So I don't know if there are any regulatory stuff like that that's really harming international shipping. It's all very, very complex. I mean, another example we saw recently in the United States is this uh, baby formula shortage. And it turns out a large driver of that is that we have this insane protectionist policies on baby formula that caused 80%, I believe, of baby formula made in the United States to be made from one factory. And then it's not quite illegal, but very difficult and expensive to import baby formula from other countries. And that caused a huge mess when that factory had to close down for a few weeks. You know, that kind of nonsense. I don't know if there's anything applicable to board games or international shipping specifically that would that could be gotten rid of to reduce the costs, I'd have to look into it more. Next economic question is, I believe from the same person, you have a background in economics, which board games actually accurately model economic systems and theory? So I have published two articles on this. One is about sidereal confluence and the other one is about brass. And I think both of those do a really good job at highlighting different parts of economic theory, sidereal confluence about trade and brass about entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial foresight. Uh, so I highly recommend those articles, but really any game that has trading models economic theory, because trade is so, so fundamental to economics. And if you pull back and abstract it even more, any game that has choices, which some would argue are all games, necessarily have choices, are about economics too. Because economics is really kind of the study of choice and decision making. There's a really tight link there. So when you look at the very foundations of economics as an area of study, it comes from the fact that we make choices. That's like the number one thing. And in fact, you can derive the supply and demand curves from the statement, people make choices. Very quickly, here's how you do this. You go with people make choices, which you can posit as kind of self-evident. And from choices, you can get to, it's called a preference list. So in other words, um, if you split, if you take any item, any good, or even a unit of time into marginal units, and this is part of where we get uh, what's called the marginal revolution, which is very important in the history of economics. Um, and you say, okay, if you had five units of this thing, what are the things you would do with those? And then you can make a list. Well, if I had only one, this is what I would do. If I had two, I'd, my second one would go towards this other purpose. And so just from the fact that we make choices, we can posit this kind of preference list of, you know, if we had various amounts of X object, uh, what would we do with them? And from there, we can understand that 
if we put those things relative to money and we insert money in as a medium of exchange, so in other words, money stands in for the kind of opportunity cost of other things you could do. So if the choice was, you know, you had two gallons of milk, maybe you would value that first gallon of milk over $2. But then second, you would value the $2. And then third, you'd value the second gallon of milk because the second one's probably just going to go bad. You don't have really any use for it. So you'd rather have the money. But you'd rather have that first gallon of milk to do milk things with, you know, drink it and make baked stuff with it. You eat your cereal, all that, uh, over the $2. And that what you're doing is essentially then drawing a demand curve. You're saying, how many units of this thing would I purchase, would I value more at X cost? And what about this other cost? And then what happens is you get a downward, downward right uh, sloping curve. And if you aggregate it out and smooth it out, you have a demand curve and then the opposite for a supply curve for people selling things. Uh, and that's how you derive supply and demand very briefly, uh, from the statement people make choices. So anything with choices really is about economics and games are really, really about opportunity costs because there's always some constricting thing. It's usually actions. Sometimes the more constricting thing are resources and money. There's just a smaller supply of stuff. Sometimes it's really action tight and you have uh, not very many actions to do a lot of things with. Um, even real-time games, right? You have a timed element. There's some kind of restricting thing on you doing what you want. And therefore, you have to make tough choices. And the things you forego are your opportunity costs. And that's really what games are about. So games as a whole are really tied into economics. But if you want to look at two games that highlight specific aspects of economics really well, look at my articles about sidereal confluence, which is really about how awesome trade is, trade being mutually beneficial, uh, and brass, which really highlights entrepreneurship, which is about foresight and understanding what is going to be valuable in the future, or at least trying to predict what's going to be value valuable in the future, which may or may not be correct. However, there are two areas in which games step away from normal economic analysis. And I've talked about this before. I haven't yet written an article on it. Um, but I think there are two places where you get away from what would be considered normal economic analysis. In other words, how people act and make choices. Uh, and that is because games have an absolute end point. In other words, we know the game will stop and your score will be tallied at a specific point, even if that point isn't like a number of rounds or a number of turns, uh, even if it's determined by player actions, there is an end point. Uh, whereas, you know, you could say life has an end point when you die, but even then people make choices for future generations and for the future generally. That doesn't happen in games. You don't make choices in most games. I've, that reminds me, I have to play Oath still. I have a copy of it. But in most games... Uh, you make choices for that game. Legacy games and campaign games extend that out, but there's still usually a final endpoint. And that can skew a lot of things. The second way is that games have a single winner. And in life, that's, I hope at least, I desperately hope, that's not how you perceive life as you must win at the cost of everything, everyone else, and you must be better than everyone at something by the end? I don't know. But most games are like that. You want to be better at the game than everyone else, and you are the winner, and everyone else is the loser to various degrees. That changes a whole bunch of stuff really significantly where people maybe at the beginning of the game are making what you might consider like economically valid. I don't know. Choices that track onto how people make choices in real life. Uh, but by the end of games, usually people are making choices that do not track in unless you think like you're going to die and you want to take it all with you, that kind of thing. I mean, that's kind of how board games functions. At the end, you know, you're going to, your, your avatar, your player, whatever your agency is, is going to cease to exist. And the only thing that matters is winning the game. Again, hopefully, I very much hope that's not how you perceive your own life and your own choices. So there's a disconnect there. Next question. What are some of your unpopular opinions in both the board gaming and non-board gaming space? I thought about doing a video on this and I tried to write it out. And I tried to find some unpopular opinions that I had. 
Here's my unpopular opinions, opinion about board games. I don't think people have that many unpopular opinions. I mean, I guess from a statistical standpoint, right? You, no one has that many unpopular opinions or else they wouldn't be unpopular to some degree. But I think even the stuff that gets thrown out there is this is super unpopular are typically like mildly unpopular. Maybe it's like a 50-50 thing. Some people like it. Some people dislike it. Like people will throw out, you know, I don't like Catan that much. Well, I mean, diehard hobbyists, like, I don't know, 50% maybe like Catan a lot and 50% are kind of like, eh, it's fine. So how unpopular is that really? Or it's something that they think is unpopular, but is probably actually popular. It's just that the people who disagree with them are very loud and annoying. That happens a lot. They're like, this is an unpopular opinion. And I'm sitting here thinking, who would disagree with that? Just like the crazy people and the trolls. That's not actually unpopular. It's just, you know, not what the trolls say. And we know it's not unpopular because the people who disagree with you, we call trolls, right? They are necessarily, I think, by definition, those people are not, or have unpopular opinions or else they wouldn't be considered trolls. But really, like... How many unpopular like game opinions do I have? I hated playing Rising Sun, but I think the the consensus on that game is shifting. I don't hear anyone talking about that game anymore. I still hear much more talk about Blood Rage than Rising Sun. I like Scrabble probably more than most people. I think it's an interesting game. What else haven't I liked that's popular? Again, Catan, I think Wingspan is okay. Oh, I'll throw out not the not the harp on the uh the new award-winning cascadia but i thought it was fine it seems like the people who made it are are very well liked and respected so good for them uh it does seem like a a spiel kind of game maybe not the most original game that they've uh given their prize to but they don't necessarily look for originality i played it twice i have no desire to play it again but i mean really cascadia is not like people aren't calling cascadia like absolute masterpiece mind-blowing game they're saying oh look a really nice pleasant lighter game that's what they're saying about it they're saying it's really nice and pleasant and i can see that my first play i thought it was really nice and pleasant by the end of my second play i thought i've seen everything here where the big disputes i think it's over the smaller more challenging games and games that bleed over into larger cultural disputes that's where we see kind of heated opinions but i think Overall, I think there's more consensus on what a good board game is than in other types of media. And I think, again, this is all hypothesizing. I don't have the data for this. I think it would be interesting to try to find data on this. I don't know. I think it's because games might interact with our psychology in more fundamental ways. So like games are operating on decisions and computation and tension and reveal and really, really basic narrative structures, not complex stuff, uh, more universal feelings. And so the, while there's some disputes, I mean, by and large, there are pretty big consensuses on what like the great games are, which I guess in, well, even in movies, right? You'll see people ratting on like Citizen Kane a lot and you'll see people getting down on, I don't know, Scorsese seems to be the big one on, on lately on Twitter. I think if I ran, if I found some way to analyze data on this, I think we would find that there's more broad consensus on what a good board game is than a good movie among all people. And maybe that's because movies aspire to be a higher art than board games. Board games are really about just hitting the happy feelings in our brain on a really basic level in the movies oftentimes uh, or many times I suppose try to be more elevated and more um, conceptually or thematically analytical so it might just be a matter of aim but overall I think my most unpopular opinion perhaps maybe it's not unpopular is that uh, people really like to talk about unpopular opinions because that plays nicely with social media numbers it gets clicks. So I think people throw out their opinions and say they're unpopular, even if they don't necessarily believe them or don't know if they're unpopular, just because 
if you talk about unpopular things, then people click on it. I mean, I, I did a tweet recently that I said is maybe an unpopular take. Uh, I don't know if it is, and it led to one of my articles. So I, I get the appeal there. You want to seem different and edgy and cool, I guess. Outside of board game media, uh, what are my unpopular opinions? I have some movie ones. The only movie I have ever given a one to on IMDb uh, is American Beauty. I found it gross and nasty, like on a moral level, it made me angry. I don't remember my specific problems with it. I remember vaguely what some of my problems were with it, but I I came out of the movie thinking that it was actually an immoral movie. Like it's just wrong about so many things and so many important things. Um, I also thought the aesthetic was really gross. I've decided I'm kind of done with Marvel stuff. Like it's just not interesting to me anymore. It's more, that's more ambivalence. And I think a, a good number of people are the same way. I think we're finally, a lot of people are finally getting overloaded with it. Although I'd go back and watch, you know, one of the Marvel movies I liked most if that was on TV, I guess. That's what someone else was watching. Maybe. You know, I'd watch Iron Man again, maybe. But I'm not going to seek it out. Outside of movies, uh, I'm weird with music. I don't understand the appeal of the radio. Uh, in other words, I don't understand the appeal of listening to random songs in an unde- like a random order. So I don't use shuffle at all. It doesn't make sense to me. I listen to either whole albums or I'll listen to sometimes I've made a playlist of a single person or single band's music of the songs that I like the most from them. If I don't really like this, you know, if the, if the album's like 60 to 70 percent songs I like and 30 to 40 percent I don't really like at all, I might cut those songs out. Uh, but most of the time, like 90 to 95 percent of the time, I'm listening to whole albums front to back. And then maybe I was thinking about my most unpopular opinion, media related. And this isn't so much an opinion as a really weird gut thing and maybe some weird part of my psychology from my upbringing that you could probably analyze for a long time. I don't understand dancing at all. I don't get it. And people look at me really strangely when I say that. And rightly so. I mean, among like things that I, as far as I understand, are cross-cultural, like truly cross-cultural, like every single culture that we know of has it. I think dancing is one of the couple of things. (laughs) So it seems to be fundamentally human. I do not understand it at all. You don't want to go to a concert with me. I just sit there or stand there and and absorb the music internally. (laughs) Uh, When I was in high school, a bunch of my high school friends were really into ballroom dance and swing dance. And it made me extremely uncomfortable to do the the couple times I was dragged to do it. Like almost having panic attacks, uncomfortable. I don't understand watching it. I've tried watching all kinds. And I can appreciate, you know, that if someone seems to be very good at it, I can recognize that it's they they are talented at that thing. But emotionally does nothing for me. Like literally nothing. It's It feels so alien to observe. And then to do dancing, I find unbearably sexual, which is what made it very weird in high school because, like, I was raised, I was homeschooled and among conservative Christians all the time. And so the fact that they were all into this dancing made me extremely confused how they were getting away with it. I'm like, y'all are just doing this to, like, This is the only socially acceptable way to touch girls, right? Even if it's just like their hand and like their shoulder. (laughs) Like that's that's what's happening, right? But it seemed like they genuinely enjoyed it as its own thing, a non a non sexual thing. Uh, but I found it horribly uncomfortable. So I don't know what's going on in my brain. That's a weird one. I suppose if you really wanted to dive in there, you'd probably find some interesting psychological insights. I don't understand dancing. If you like it, good for you. I'll just ignore it. Moving on. We had a couple of food questions. uh, Because I I enjoy cooking. I think I'm decent at it in some ways. Some very, very specific ways I I, I am decent at cooking. Uh, And so the question is, what are some good beginner or intermediate food making level ups? Uh, So fortunately, there was a book that had the title of the book is the answer to this question. 
The book is called Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat by, and I'm going to mispronounce this name, I apologize, Samin Nozrat, which we actually own a copy of. I looked at it a little bit and it looks fantastic. Uh, That's the answer to the question. Salt, fat, acid, heat, that's cooking. Uh, If it doesn't taste right, it probably needs salt, fat, or acid. If it tastes dry and bland and cardboardy, it probably needs fat. Probably should have added more butter or oil or something in there when you're cooking it. If it tastes flavorless, probably needs salt. If it feels like it's it has flavor, but it's kind of one note, probably wants acid in the form of vinegar or citrus or something like that. Um, and then heat is you know just what cooking is. You heat stuff up to change it on a mo- on a molecular level. I mean that's really the answer. Using salt, understanding how much salt to put in something which doesn't have to be like table salt, could be soy sauce, could be all sorts of things to add salinity. Uh, But understanding how much salt to put in something completely changed my perception of what cooking was. And then the acid thing is kind of the next level. Other than that, just like find good resources, which for me largely has been J. Kenji Lopez Alt, who's awesome and extremely scientific with his cooking. And also understands that home cooking isn't about following precise recipes, but just understanding the basic concepts and then you just make it. I also learned a lot from an Italian restaurant I worked at for a couple of years where I was a server, but uh, it was, we learned a lot about the process of Italian food, which I enjoy greatly because Italian food is all about just finding whatever you have and then making something delicious from it with very, very, basic principles, uh, like using starchy pasta water to help uh, your pasta sauces, just treating things very simply. My wife Amber is very, very good at spices, and she loves making Indian food and Chinese food and stuff like that. She has a big old spice rack. I rarely use anything other than salt and pepper, because you can make some stuff really, really delicious with salt and pepper, like almost anything. So uh, that's my beginner or intermediate food tips, cooking tips. I don't have any baking tips as I very, very rarely bake, but with olive oil, salt, and pepper, I can make almost anything taste decent. Final food question is what is my favorite shape of pasta? So my favorite shape is probably cavatelli. It's just like a nice little nugget of pasta. It's fairly, you can use it with a lot of stuff. It's fairly dense. But honestly, I like lots of pasta. I don't really care that much about the shape um, as long as it's appropriate for whatever you're putting in the pasta. Some shapes work better with different types of sauces and stuff like that. Uh, But honestly, I don't care that much about the shape of the pasta. Cavatelli is really nice, but it might just be that one of my favorite things at the restaurant that we worked at was our spring cavatelli pasta, which was absolutely delicious. Uh, But my favorite pasta, if you call it pasta. I guess it's considered pasta as gnocchi. I love the texture of gnocchi, especially when they crisp it up. So you get the really, really, really soft gnocchi, but it's been like pan fried on one side or multiple sides. It has that kind of crispy exterior. That's really, really good. Two more questions. Back to board games. What are some games that you've encountered that you have the most uncertainty about? Matt asked this one because he said, for me, photosynthesis Feels like it could be great, but it's unlikely I'll have the right setting to know. I believe one year I called photosynthesis my most medium game of the year. (laughs) I think we only played it twice. Uh, I didn't play it enough to review it, I think. I just played it and I'm like, this is completely forgettable. Um, So I looked around my shelves. Here are the games that I would want to play more because I have a number of games that I just need to play more before I can review them because I I am not sure yet. And here are some of them. Uh, First is Rome and Roll, which is definitely a pun because Rome and sounds like Roman, and it is a Roman-themed game. It's a Roman-themed roll-and-write game, and it's either kind of good or it's just someone turning a normal medium-to-medium-heavy Euro game completely unnecessarily into a roll and write game. And I wasn't, 
I need to play it probably one or two more times before I can settle on what it is, because it's very bizarre. It is a pretty complex game, but it's also a Roland, right? And I recall last time I played thinking, I think this game would play better if it wasn't a Roland, right? Which then makes the Roland, right thing actually really, really annoying and gimmicky. Next game, Sekigahara, which is a widely loved war game, block war game, and it has some really cool stuff. I remember last time I played it, which was probably four or five years ago, thinking that the strategy may converge into very similar things, and then thinking, I don't know if that's a bad thing. Like, just based on the geography of the map and the kind of the A uh, symmetric starting positions of the, of the two players. And of course the, the random card draw, which is very significant for Seki Gahara. But I think, I, I think I remember thinking that's kind of going to play out very similarly from game to game, but then wondering if that's an issue. So I don't know about that one. 4X is another game I got to play more before I review. It might be really, really brilliant. It might be a fascinating dumpster fire. It's one of those two things. Curious Cargo, I played once. I think we talked about it on the podcast. I got to play it more. It, it had a very, very different cadence to what I expected it to have, so I don't feel like I actually got even a proper play of it. Uh, Glass Road, which I think is getting a reprint from Capstone, I think, or just got one. I have the original Z-Man, I think, version, and it's a very constrained Uwe game. So... I don't know what I think of that one. I, I recall coming out of my last play, which I, th I think was my second play, thinking that there just wasn't enough to explore. It does play much more quickly than many of Uwe Rosenberg's games, or at least his heavier games, but I don't know. Undaunted, I played once, and everyone loves this game. I have Undaunted North Africa, which maybe plays differently than the first one, which I think was was France. In, in the in the French front in World War II, but I've only played like the first scenario and it's it was very dull. But I think that's just because it's like the first scenario. I think it's just because that's the tutorial scenario because there are a bunch of mechanisms that we did not use in the game. And I think once those open up, it might be better. Conceptually, it had some really cool stuff with deck building in a war game. So I gotta just play some other scenarios. Uh, For science is another one I'm uncertain about because we haven't yet found a difficulty setting that actually feels difficult enough without being feeling impossible. So we just got to find what our good difficulty setting is. Orleon, uh, I got to play more. Orion and I figured out that there's kind of like two openings you can use that are pretty much set in stone, and I don't know how that affects the game. That one, though, I think ultimately is going to be like one of those six and a half to seven out of ten games. So it's just more the angle it takes, but I've had a, a pretty good time with Orleon. Two more. Uh, Small Railroad Empires I played just a couple of days ago. I think it might not be very good, but I want to give it another shot on a different map because I also got a couple of the map packs when I purchased this used. But it seems like the kindest, softest train game ever, and who wants a kind train game? I don't know what you get from that. And then finally, Brian Boru, which I think might be really great, but it might just be decently great, but we've got to play it more. Yeah, those are the games I looked around, at least the first ones that stood out that I have the most uncertainty about. But honestly, like most of the time, I have a pretty good understanding of what my final opinion on a game is going to be after the first play. It's very rare that my initial score that I usually I usually post an initial score just to remember. It's rare that that score moves more than one point out of my ten point scale after multiple plays. So take with that what you will. Final question about reviewing since I've been writing about this a lot, so I've made this the final question. Uh, it is. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about how board game reviews and critique compared to other popular forms of criticism like book, movie, theater, and album reviews, especially if you think another form is most similar to board game reviewing or is a good model to follow. I don't know if thinking about it from a model perspective makes a lot of sense, and I think that might be complicating things. 
at least for popular reviewing. So in other words, consumer facing reviews. Obviously, there's criticism, especially in literary areas in some of those higher quote unquote arts uh, that can get extremely technical and they can get very uh, academic and that's fine. Uh, but I'm talking about popular reviews that are going to be read by everyday people when they're researching the book, movie, game, whatever. And I think it's pretty simple. Just make an argument, just say something and then justify the thing you just said. So I think the best movie reviews, for instance, which is the type of review other than game reviews, actually more than game reviews that I read the most, the best movie reviews just say something about the movie. They say something interesting about how that person saw the movie, how they analyzed it, and then justify those things. And that's all you kind of have to do. And so there are models like with new games journalism. Uh, if you look at, uh, that's more, that was, that was created in the context of video games where it talks about experiential, more autobiographical stuff. Yeah, you can lean that way. That's great. Or you can fully embrace it, but you're still just explaining your perspective of the thing and justifying it. For me, I'm most heavily influenced by Roger Ebert in terms of how much I admire his kind of very straightforward approach to criticism. I think he messes up in some areas in being maybe a little too simplistic in cases, or some would say far too sentimental. Uh, but I mean, how much can you criticize someone for being sentimental, like having sentiment? And so I always think back, he's also extremely good at word economy. He's extremely good at expressing things very simply with very few words. Because for a large part of his career, he's operating with, what, a 400, 500 word limit, uh, which is very difficult to do. I'm also influenced in terms of writing style by other people like C.S. Lewis or David Foster Wallace. From C.S. Lewis, I think, again, he's a master of explaining things very simply and clearly and not being afraid of appearing too much of like a simpleton or not academic enough, even as he's explaining academic things. And then David Foster Wallace, I return to his, his nonfiction, at least I return to semi-frequently if I feel like I'm getting too rigid and constrained in my writing to see how freeing his, his writing is and, and how often casual it is, how grammatically loose he can be while also being extremely communicatively tight. So in other words, he will do very odd, unusual grammatical things with punctuation. And obviously he's famous for footnotes, but he'll always do it to communicate something more clearly, even as elaborate as it can be. So that I return to a lot, but that's just for like style. For how we analyze things, I've written a lot about it. I'm coming down to, you just got to start a conversation, like what's worth saying, what's interesting. And I'm realizing that the benefit, a lot of people see the benefit of any kind of criticism or review is just in the recommendation or the, the unrecommendation. Should I buy this thing or not? And yeah, a good review will contribute to that decision, but I think a good review is justified in its own right, right? A good review of something will help you see things in a new way, or they'll help you think about connections that you didn't see before, right? Which is why all the best like movie reviews are even better once you've watched the movie. They're valuable in their own right. They're not just valuable as a recommendation because like recommendations are really easy to do. You can just say, I recommend it. Here's a couple of bullet points, move on. But to write something that's interesting and valuable and worth reading outside of that context, that's the real goal. Otherwise, I don't think, I don't think in terms of models or, or anything like that. I mean, what are board games closest to? They're closest to video games. Uh, what are games closest to? Depends on the game, right? So a, a heavy historical game is going to be closer to like reviewing historical nonfiction. A... Ameritrash, crazy 
dice rolling, you know, everyone's excited type game might be closest to like a movie, right? It's more, it's more immediate, but I don't, I don't know if those comparisons are close enough to really matter that much. And also if we think too closely about comparing and copying these other forms, we lose out on how, on how we can communicate uniquely about games because games are unique. So I think a lot of people, they're trying to find this like systemic solution to board game reviewing where you just plug in what the game is about and all these factors and some machine will pump out a recommendation or a score. You can't do that. That's impossible. That's, that's both impossible to do and not worth doing because it's never about fully the recommendation. It's about the actual piece of writing or video or whatever itself being interesting. And so there's something I tell my people, my students who are, I'm, I coach, who I give uh, help to in their speeches, especially for speeches that are different each time, not pre-written ones. And the big piece of advice I really try to impart is that you want the audience, or in this case, since they're competing, the judge, to think, oh, I haven't thought about that, this thing in that way before. If you get the judge to think that, you're going to have a successful speech because now they're actually engaging with what you're talking about. They're not passive, they're active in their listening because now you've given them something, a new angle, a new bit of, a new fact, um, a new bit of analysis that they haven't heard or thought about before or haven't thought about consciously before that's causing them to re-examine the subject or even re-examine subjects adjacent to what you're talking about. And if you can get them to do that, then you have a memorable good speech. So I think in the end, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to express my thoughts, my analysis on the game as best as I can so that I, so that people can think, oh, I haven't thought about that mechanism that way before, that, that game in that way before. And of course, you shouldn't do that dishonestly, you shouldn't present analysis that you don't actually think is true or could be true just for novelty's sake. That's dishonest. Uh, but I've found the more I focus on that kind of thing, the more times that actually helps my analysis of trying to poke and prod the thing and understand more deeply and better how the game influenced me and how I influenced the game and what caused my experience of the game to happen. So that's my answer to the question, which is very, very far from where we started with that question, but hopefully that makes sense. This was fun. I'm glad I did this. Uh, and it was about the right amount of time to answer these questions. Hopefully you found this interesting. Once again, I hate to ask for, for support again and again and again, but I'm going to do it anyways. Oh, I forgot to end with my thank you for listening. I believe that's how I end these things. But if you would like to support me, go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer. You can find everything I do at the thoughtful gamer.com. I'm on YouTube. Go sub subscribe to my YouTube channel. If I get to a thousand subscribers, I can start making a little bit of money from YouTube, which will be encouraging. It won't be that much money at first, but I think I'm starting to make better and better videos. So I think if you like the podcast, you'll like the YouTube stuff. None of it's too long. I will never, ever, ever, ever pad out one of my videos. I hate these YouTube videos where they clearly had like three minutes of things to say, but they pushed it out to 10 minutes. I think it gives you another ad slot so you make more money from the video. I will never do that, but please subscribe. You can rate and review this podcast on whatever podcast system, app, whatever you use. I have no one here to ask if I've missed anything on this on this outro. It's just me, alone in the basement, surrounded by games. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. <laughs>